Hi everyone, my name is Richard Taylor. I'm head of the physics department at the University of Oregon in the United States. In addition to being a physicist, I also have an art background. And throughout my life, I've always wanted to combine those two passions of art and science. And at an early age, I gravitated towards nature's patterns because surely everyone must be interested in nature's patterns. And in particular, I became fascinated with what's called bioinspiration, this idea that you can learn from nature and then apply what you learn to an artificial system. And bioinspiration has served me well in many different disciplines, but without a doubt, the areas that have the biggest potential for the future are design and architecture. Now, nature's beauty is profound. We humans have been surrounded by nature's aesthetics for millions and millions of years through evolution. And looking out at nature triggers many positive responses in our bodies, including striking reductions in stress levels and mental fatigue. And nature provides these health benefits for free. And yet over the past 100 years or so, we've chosen to live in built environments that slowly disconnect us from nature's healing qualities. So in 2017, I teamed up with Anastasia and Martin Lazier to form what's called the Science Design Lab. And our mission is to develop science-informed, human-focused patterns based on nature's aesthetics. Now, in many ways, I'm lucky to be at the University of Oregon and in 1975, the famous architect Christopher Alexander was asked to optimize our campus environment based on the needs of the professors and the students. And the subsequent book called The Oregon Experiment became a famous example of human-centered design. And the biophilia movement and hypothesis was announced a few years later, declaring that society needs to accommodate people's inherent need to connect to nature. What struck me was some of the supporting psychology experiments that quantified the impact of exposure to nature. And this included remarkable stress reducing effects that were so powerful that they even caused patients to recover more quickly from major surgery. However, these pioneering experiments never identified the quality in nature that was triggering these remarkable effects. And this question, what is the essence of nature's beauty, is perhaps one of the most profound questions that we as humans could ask. And I arrived at this question through my studies of Jackson Pollock, uh, an amazing major artists from the 1950s who poured paint directly onto horizontal canvases. And his paintings are valued anywhere up to $600 million. And that makes them some of the most expensive paintings in the world. So you might ask, well, why are they so expensive? Well, many people have referred to his work as being organic and natural, hinting that perhaps he managed to capture nature's aesthetics onto his canvas. So I decided to put this to the test using a computer where I'd use a computer to analyze his paintings and compare those patterns to those found in nature. And to do this, I made use of a scientific discovery that nature's scenery is consistent of what's called fractal patterns. Now, fractals are patterns that repeat at different size scales. So a great example from our everyday lives are trees. So if you look at the big branches, if you zoom in on those, you'll see smaller branches, zoom in on those and you'll see smaller and smaller branches. And it's that repetition at different size scales that's referred to a fractal. And they're also referred to as the fingerprint of nature because they're so prevalent in nature. And common examples, in addition to trees, include rivers, mountains, clouds, and lightning. And so I used the computer to show that Pollock's patterns were as fractal as those found in everyday natural scenery. Now, significantly, Pollock wasn't the first artist to paint fractal art. There are examples spanning many centuries from many different cultures in many different continents, starting with Hellenic friezes in 300 BC. And this is true of architecture as well, starting with the Barabador temple in Indonesia in 800 AD. But there are many more contemporary examples, such as uh, 
Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture and Gothic architecture. And these were all created well before the scientific declaration and understanding of fractals, emphasizing our intuitive connection and our ability to recognize fractals. And this intuition is driven by our natural appreciation of fractal beauty. And over the years, I've worked with many different psychology groups around the world, developing a model that we've now called fractal fluency. And this declares that through evolution, our vision has become fluent in the visual language of fractals. So when we see fractals, this triggers a cascade of automatic processes that unfold in our visual systems in a matter of milliseconds. So well before we've even consciously recognized the pattern, we've already started to receive its positive benefits. In a way, we are hardwired to want to look at fractal patterns. Now, our initial experiments were funded by NASA to keep astronauts stress-free. However, there are many applications in our daily lives. So just think about students taking exams or when you are running through an airport to catch a flight or a patient in a dentist waiting room. Now, given that, st that stress is recognized as a major health concern and it's capable of inducing deep depression and even schizophrenia, and for example, it's costing the US more than $300 billion a year. This is a remarkable opportunity to improve the society. An opportunity that has increased dramatically in recent times due to stresses related to the COVID pandemic. Now the Science Design Lab is built on the value of interdisciplinary collaboration. In our art science mission, We've developed software that generates and analyzes the fractal patterns. So this allows the design team to feed in seed patterns based on their design aesthetics. The analysis then checks to determine if the resulting patterns are consistent with those known to induce stress reduction and that are likely to refresh people mentally. Now, this iterative process might require a number of cycles back and forth between what we call the design police in Austria and the fractal police in the US, because it's important to get every step in the process correct. And our time differences have allowed us to sometimes to work around the clock when necessary. Now we launched our mission using flooring designs because floors are a large space within the built environment. However, we've rapidly expanded to develop ceiling and wall design, along with window shades that cast fractal shadows through the rooms. In addition to visual fractals, we've also combined them with fractal music to create what we call atmospheric fractals. And here, people are immersed into an environment which multiple of their senses are stimulated by fractals. We recognize that we will need to design fractal designs uh, that are for different subgroups of the population and also for buildings with different functions. And our future psychology experiments will investigate these fractals, ensuring that our designs are both science-informed and human-centered. Now we've collected all of our current fractal images into what are called the fractal library, and this offers uh, many great potential applications to designers and architects. So I hope that you take a look at that fractal library and thank you for listening.